Good morning. Morning. I am sitting here with William Robinson, Democrat who served the House from 1989 to 2002, representing the 19th District in Allegheny County. Thank you for being with me here today. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Great. Um, I'd like to start out by asking you about your background. Tell me about your family life, your childhood, growing up, and your education. Well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, in the Hill District community. Uh, still live there. Uh, I have two children, uh, William Russell Robinson II and now to Namibia Robinson. My mother, Annie uh, Kemp Robinson, is still alive and well. My sister, Barbara Ponder, is still there. And I have some nieces and nephews, uh, all in the Hill District community. Uh, I went to Madison Elementary School, Heron Hill Junior High School, which is now, it was Malines Middle School. It is now uh, University Academy, soon to have another name. And I graduated from Shenley High School in 1960. And that was back in the day when you had neighborhood schools mm -hmm. and where there were lots of people in the neighborhoods in, in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, just had a great childhood, some great childhood friends there. I always said, all roads lead to the hill. And it's right in the center of the, the city of Pittsburgh, within walking distance of downtown, within walking distance of Oakland, where most of the major universities are. Mm -hmm. And it was just a, a, a great community to grow up in, and uh, I had lots of fun. Oh, that's great. Um, did you have anyone in your family that was involved in politics? My Uncle Hubert. Um, we used to meet on Saturday mornings and have breakfast and talk about politics, even before I decided to run, because he, um, he loved politics. And he was one of the founding members of an organization called the Allegheny County Colored Democrats. And this was an organization that existed before uh, the various ethnic organizations were brought together under the banner of the Democratic Party. And he had a little pen uh, that he showed me from time to time. We talked about old time party politics. And then uh, a little known secret is that uh, my grandfather on my mother's side <clears throat> was a Republican mm. down in a community called uh, Rush Run, West Virginia. He's a pretty big man in that town. And uh, he was a committee man, and he was one of the few people in the community, black or white, who had a car. But the car wasn't kept there. Uh, you had to get on literally one of those railroad things and, and go up to Thurman, mm. where the big city. And the car was in the garage up there. Uh, or you could take the train, but the train didn't, didn't uh, travel real regularly. So uh, once I found out about my grandfather's interest in politics and, uh, and my uncle's interest, it spurred my interest. And so um, those are the two people uh, who sort of interest me in politics. Other than one other person, <clears throat> my Aunt Elizabeth mm -hmm. uh, Robinson, who's deceased now, over in Columbus, Ohio. And she loved politics and she loved Ohio State football. I'm a graduate of the Ohio State University, 1964, and uh, was on the track team. I lettered, and as I'm older and more mature, now that means more to me that I was in big time college athletics. I got a letter, I got a jacket, I got a sweater. I actually won some medals. But getting back to my Aunt Liz, uh, she always talked to me about politics, mm -hmm. and she was a Republican. And she was the first person of color that I knew of who was a Republican who tried to convince me that the Republican Party had the best interests of people of color at heart. And it was hard for me to absorb that. My parents were Democrats. I grew up in a Democratic county and Democratic community. But there were a lot of prominent African Americans, people of color, who were Republicans uh, in Columbus, Ohio, in the state of Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, more so than e here in Pennsylvania. And so we had some interesting conversations about politics and political activity. I was a student. Uh, she had been involved in politics. She worked for the state. She had friends, uh, high-powered friends, both black and white, mm. who were Republicans. So I got a greater appreciation at an early age about bipartisan politics. Wow. Um, what was your career before running for the House? Right before I ran for the House, I worked at the Human Relations Commission um, in the city of Pittsburgh. I was an investigator, field investigator. And um, it was a job I did not do as well as I should have. Mm. Now that job to two women, Alma Fox 
and Connie Wellens, who went to bat for me um, with Mayor Richard Calagiri and helped get me that job. And uh, they were loyal friends. Um, they knew I had a family to take care of, and they, they helped me. Uh, I had a political history, which was holding me back. I was on Pittsburgh City Council from 78 through 85. Outspoken, opinionated, progressive, and I guess from time to time a pain in the rear end for some people. And so the fact that these two women would step forward for me uh, has always meant a lot. Both of them are still alive and well, and I thank them publicly every time I get a, get a chance. Uh, to, to keeping me going and really putting me in a position uh, to run for uh, the legislature. Uh, and bef like I said, before I went to the Human Relations Commission, I was on a sabbatical. And I took an opportunity after I left Pittsburgh City Council in 85 mm -hmm. to relax. I didn't work for a whole year. I didn't have health insurance for a whole year. My family had no health coverage for a whole year. We survived. No major financial catastrophe, no major health catastrophe. And I just took that time uh, to enjoy life, yeah. to sleep in, to read, uh, to go out and touch the buildings. When David Lawrence was mayor of Pittsburgh, one of the things he would do oftentimes is at night, literally go out and walk through the streets of Pittsburgh and touch the buildings to get a real feel for the city. Hmm. That was um, his charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember leaving office, uh, city council, and being on my own and touching buildings, literally going out, and I had time to stop and talk to people. But I found myself sometimes uh, in the evenings touching buildings. Hmm. Uh, and I, I think I got an appreciation of what, what it was he, was he was doing, that connection that you want to have with this, this city that you love. Right. That's really neat. Um, tell me about the steps leading up to running for the House of Representatives. Uh, the 19th District had been represented by Leroy Irvis for uh, many years before I ran. And I'd always said I would never run against him, not that the opportunity presented itself. Mm. But people would always say I was preparing myself to run against Leroy Irvis, and I, and I couldn't understand that, why they would say that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I had bigger dreams, to be very honest. I saw myself as possibly the mayor or congressman, um, I, I didn't, or a county commissioner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had no reason to run against Lee Irvis. I had no selfish reason. I had no political reason. I had no reasons of, a, of right. ambition. But when he announced that he wasn't going to run again, I felt I was obligated, uh, one, because I admired him so much and respected him so much, but also, as I said, I wasn't doing as good a job as I could have done uh, at the Human Relations Commission. And I felt that uh, I needed to move on and I needed to try something else. And I thought about all the things I wanted to do. And I said, other than be a player in the NFL, I can't think of anything else other than continuing my political career. And so I set out to contact people uh, about running and uh, put my shoulder to the wheel, and uh, in 1988, I was successful. Great. Um, did you enjoy campaigning? Yes. I always enjoyed campaigning because I had a chance to get out and shake people's hands, mm -hmm. another version of touching the buildings, of getting out, shaking people's hands, talking to them, um, and, and, and following up on my career in city council. Uh, I worked hard. I was innovative. I created the first alternative budget in the history of the city of Pittsburgh um, when I was on city council. And I just really felt good about offering myself uh, to the public. I knew I'd work hard. Uh, I knew I was qualified. Uh, I knew I had a passion for it. I knew I had to fire in my belly. And so campaigning was, uh, became a, a part of my life, became a part of my, my every day. Did you have a lot of help from family and friends when campaigning? Yes. Yeah. My mother gave me um, a significant contribution. Of all the contributions I've received over the years, my mother has given me two of the largest. She's not number one. Mm -hmm. There is someone who's number one. But my mother gave me two huge contributions. Uh, and I built on it. I had, I had about $8,000 left over 
from when I was running for, uh, when I was on city council. And I kept that money intact. And so when I got ready to run for state rep, I had $8,000 already in the bank, and I built upon that. Mm. And believe it or not, money that I raised for state rep is still in the bank today when I'm a county councilman. And I'm very, I thank God that uh, that opportunity presented itself because, like I said, uh, I speak my own mind, I go my own way, and that's not necessarily yeah. the best way to try to, uh, to, to raise funds for, for, for a campaign. But uh, I had um, family and friends who believed in me, and we worked real hard. I was a fresh, new face. And uh, there were those who respected the fact that I served on city council. Right. Uh, and they wanted me to continue in some capacity, and the opportunity presented itself. And uh, like I said, it was a godsend mm -hmm. uh, that I was able to, to campaign, to bring together family and friends, and then be successful. Did campaigning get easier? with every term? Uh, for me it did because I didn't have a lot of opposition. Okay. Uh, ultimately I think that worked to my disadvantage because I don't think I prepared myself as well as I should have. Mm. I should have been preparing, been preparing for war in a time of peace. Um, I don't think my political skills were as good as they should have been. The governmental skills, the oratorial skills and things of that type, I could do that. I had my staff well organized. But I think in terms of really building the political base, I did not do that. And that came back to haunt me. And when I really needed it, it wasn't there. Uh, but the campaigning, it, it never was a problem, except I didn't build that base. And if I had to do it all over again, I would build a base. When I ran for a county council, I took all the lessons I had previously learned. And the constituency is twice as big. It's over 110,000 people. Um, and I organized a little better. I organized like I was running for my life. I organized like I had to win an office that was paying $9,000 a year, $3,000 in expenses, and no personal staff. I ran just like I was running for state mm. rep again. And, man, did I feel good. <laughs> Good for you. Um, describe for me the 19th district in both geography and constituents. The 19th district changed um, <clears throat> my last campaign. Okay. That worked against me as well. Um, there used to be a lot of public housing in the 19th district. It had more public housing than any district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It had the highest concentration of public housing of any major city. Um, ethnically, people of color, people who look like me, represented most of that <coughs> district and most of the people in public housing. Uh, maybe 50% of all the people of color lived in public housing, and most of the public housing was in my district. So I had a district where the people looked like me for the most part. It was 60-40, 60% people of color uh, and 40% others. But I had this real concentration right where I lived, literally. Um, it has changed now. It's more spread out. The population of the city of Pittsburgh has dwindled. <clears throat> and when I was a kid, we had 600,000 people in Pittsburgh. Mm. Now we're down to probably 325 or less. So as the population decreased, you had to spread the district out, and there was a concern that you had to have two minority-majority districts. One would be the 19th, one would be the 24th. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I found that the district starts stretching further west, further southeast, uh, and a little bit further north. And one of my current uh, friends and associates, Don Walker, was affected because on the north side it forced him out of the city mm -hmm. uh, with his district so that I could have more. And in the west end, Tom Patron was affected. And over in Hazelwood, uh, Dan Frankel, <coughs> who's still here in the house, was affected. And the district, it looked like an amoeba. And it was just very hard uh, to campaign in it. I was unfamiliar with it. Mm -hmm. A lot of new people in it. So it's the district that exists today. Now, it's going to change again when the 2010 census comes up. That district is going to dramatically change because the population of the city has dropped. And if you're going to have two districts that are predominantly African-American, you're going to have to really be creative yeah. because the African-American population isn't like 
like in Philadelphia, where you have back to back to back to back districts that are represented by people of color. We don't have that in Pittsburgh. So you may find some of the other representatives more out in the suburbs than they are now and literally leaving the city in uh, Wilkinsburg uh, to whatever minority representation is elected. Yeah. What were some of the issues that, uh, that were big with your constituents while you were in office? Employment opportunities, mm -hmm. educational opportunities. A lot of major construction occurred in my district. Okay. Uh, two new stadiums, a uh, convention center. Right. Uh, and there were people who felt that they should get a piece of that action, people of color, very frankly. Uh, and so that was a big issue, job training, education. Uh, one of my great concerns was how could the community college of Allegheny County be effectively used to educate and train not only the constituents I served, but the constituents that my colleagues served. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to serve on the House Education Committee and be the Democratic <coughs> Subcommittee Chairman for Higher Education. And so I had a lot of opportunity uh, to work on this community college issue. Mm -hmm. And today I serve as the vice chairman of our community college board back in Allegheny County. And I, I love the community college. I love the community college system, the concept. And uh, so th th that, that was a great concern. I served on the education committee here. I served on veterans and military affairs, mm -hmm. health and human services, urban affairs, and uh, perhaps the real biggie. Uh, was appropriations. Right. And I learned a lot under the tutelage of Chairman Dwight Evans. Uh, many of the things I do today as budget and finance chairman at Allegheny County Council, uh, I trace back to the teaching uh, that he gave to me and just watching him operate. And <clears throat> oftentimes on the record, uh, I mention his name and thank him. I, I think I wrote him a letter once and thanked him for, one, selecting me for that committee Two, for allowing me to learn at his, at his feet, so to speak, and also uh, because I was smart enough to absorb uh, what he had uh, uh, given to me, and now I was using it in a very positive sense. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to get into uh, to your committee work in a bit, but prior to that, um, when you first came to the House, uh, do you remember your first swearing-in ceremony? Oh, yeah. It was on a day we had one of the worst storms in the history of Pennsylvania in 1989. Man, oh day, that was terrible. Family and I were driving back around 3 o'clock. We didn't get back to Pittsburgh till around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Mm. I mean, it was so slow on that turnpike that you couldn't drive five miles before you had to stop your car, get out, and take the ice off of the windows and stuff. Uh -huh. it, 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 was, it was terrible, and there was five or six cars, a lot of people came up, and uh, that's the one thing I, <clears throat> I remember. The other thing I remember is one of my very good friends who's deceased now, Clyde Clark, performing a, a, a heroic act. Uh, that was the year that Penn State, I'm sorry, West Virginia and Notre Dame played for the national championship. Mm -hmm. They played the day before swearing in. Notre Dame won the game. And the next day, uh, two of my good friends, Noel Roach, Clyde Clark, who, who had come up <clears throat> a day in advance, and I went to uh, breakfast with Bill DeWeese. Had breakfast someplace and had good conversation, what have you, and we come over for the swearing in, what have you, and my family's not here. And I'm saying, I told my brother-in-law to get the van, I put it all together, and we are all going onto the house floor I didn't have flyers on my desk. My family wasn't there. Bob Robbins, who was in the house then, uh, had gotten two bouquets of flowers. And he was wondering, well, who does this belong to? And then he finally looks down and sees my name, and he brought them down to me. So I felt a little better. And I'm looking, and I don't see my mother, and I don't see my si sister, who, who had the floor passes. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I have to go on without them. Uh -huh. And just when the ceremony was supposed to start, I looked to my left. And there's my mother and sister standing there. And so I really felt good. Well, the other part of that story is when my brother-in-law finally got there, he let my mother and my sister out of the van in the front of the Capitol. They literally ran up the Capitol steps, came up those steps right there in the rotunda. And the doors were getting ready to close to the chambers for the ceremony to start. And my friend Clyde Clark was standing there telling them, come on, come on. This was 
back in the days when cell phones weren't very popular. Mm -hmm. And he's telling them, come on, they're going to shut the doors. He runs in there. They're behind him. He said he literally said, you can't shut that door. These women have to get in. He said he got in the doorway <laughs> so they could run past him. I said, well, what were you going to do if they shut the door? He said, man, they weren't shutting that door. Yeah. He said, no, nah, your mother and your sister, get, they're not going to shut that door. And uh, we laughed about that uh, and, and had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of good fun that day. And I remember the, the little uh, parties that the members would have. Mm -hmm. And I remember just the camaraderie, the flowers on the desks. And uh, it was just a great, great day. It was like, for me, a, a rebirth uh, to replace the Leroy Irvis and to uh, be able to serve in the oldest legislative body of its type in the world and my family there. I just, I just felt great. What were your first impressions of, of the House floor and, and even the Capitol building in general? Um, I had been up before for orientation and seen things on TV or read about in the paper. Uh, I was kind of awestruck. Mm -hmm. uh, the architecture, I mean, this is the finest Capitol anywhere in the United States of America. And I've been, I've seen a lot of them. And I knew the history. I even went up to the speaker's platform one day in the house when nobody was around. I just stood there and looked out. And I just felt great that I was a part of this. So I was, I just was looking at the architecture. I was looking at the members. Uh, I vowed when I came here the first year, I wasn't going to say anything, almost literally. And so I sat for a whole year in the house and learned. Uh, I was fortunate to sit down in leadership row. I sat right next uh, to uh, Ivan Itkin at one time and Mike Vion at another time, Mark Cohen at another time. So I learned a lot about leadership. I learned about their struggles. I learned about their successes. And very frankly, I learned about some of their failures. And I never forget one day Bill DeWeese coming over to me. I'm sitting there with the newspaper open, reading it. And I think this is before the house was on television. And he comes over and he says, wow. I heard about you. He said, you are different. He said, we're here debating an important bill, and you're reading the newspaper. And I said to him, what's wrong? He says, well, shouldn't you be paying attention? I said, I'm voting the same way you are. And he just smiled and walked away. I said, I vote the same <laughs> way you vote. <laughs> I knew that much about the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Speaking of, of learning things in your first term, was there anyone in particular that you saw as a mentor that, that, uh, that you kind of latched on to? I, I uh, spent a lot of time uh, watching uh, Dwight Evans, mm -hmm. talking to him, um, understanding the process, because at a point I wanted to be on appropriations. Not because of the extra revenue or the perks, but I really had an interest in finance. Little did I know that one day I'd be the chairman of the finance committee or the budget and finance committee for Allegheny County Council mm -hmm. and responsible for almost an $800 million budget. But I uh, spent a lot of time with Dwight uh, and uh, talked to him about a lot of different things. And so he's probably the main person. Uh, I had a, a positive experience with Mike Vion and, uh, and Bill DeWeese. Uh, I learned a lot about politics for them, the two of the best politicians I've ever met. Uh, they were very helpful to me mm -hmm. uh, legislatively. And believe it or not, uh, Matt Ryan and I developed a great relationship. He was the Republican Speaker of the House for a period of time when I was here. And Matt and I developed a good eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball relationship. And i never forget one time, Matt promised me something. And when it came time for the promise to be fulfilled, I brought it to his attention. He said, I don't remember that. And I told him where, where it occurred. And he stood there, and Roger Nick was standing next to him, his longtime aide. And he said, you told, you, you, you tell, you're telling me I told you. I said, yes, sir. Yes, you did. He said, I'll take your word. He said, Roger will have it taken care of in a half an hour. And within a half an hour, Roger called me and said, it's done. And it was done. Wow. That was probably the most positive experience I had here in terms of uh, getting things done, mm -hmm. working the other side of the aisle, where someone forgot, and this was something important, where someone forgot what it was they promised you. Mm. And he did it. And I'm going to tell you what it was. He promised me that he would appoint me to the Board of Trustees of the University of Pittsburgh as a Commonwealth trustee. 
And he did it. And he did it. Man of his word. Wow. That's a great story. That is. Um, you mentioned earlier about the different committees that you had served on, Education Committee and Urban Affairs Committee and Appropriations Committee. Was there one in particular that was your favorite? Uh, it was a toss-up between appropriations and education. Uh, in appropriations, there was a lot of party line voting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I learned a lot about finance. We was a, there was a lot of meetings. Yeah. Uh, some of them were boring, some were tiring, some were exhausting. Mm. But there were more meetings for appropriation that actually got to the heart of the matter around here, which is money. And so I enjoyed that to see how you formulate a huge budget yeah. and take into consideration all the various things. Uh, next would be education because I had a great passion for education, particularly higher education. Those are two assignments that I aspired to when I got here, while the other assignments were meaningful and I enjoyed them. I spent most of my time concentrating on education and appropriations. Mm. Great. Tell me about some of the major pieces of legislation that you were involved with, either the prime sponsor or just something that was important to you that you felt you needed to get involved. Cornerstone for me was the introduction of identity theft legislation. Pennsylvania, up until the time I introduced the legislation, didn't have an identity theft law. Mm -hmm. And I worked very diligently with Democrats and Republicans to get that done. And finally, again, crossing the aisle and working with Republicans, I made an arrangement to have my identity theft concept in an amendment attached to an agriculture bill that was coming out of the Senate. And some of my Democratic colleagues were surprised that Republicans were voting for my amendment because hmm. it passed almost overwhelmingly. But they didn't know I cut a deal. And I never forget going to a, um, a signing, bill signing, over in the governor's office. Tom Ridge was governor then. <clears throat> I walk into the office, there, the reception area, and everybody's mm -hmm. sort of looking at me like, what's he doing here? Oh, this is about agriculture. And I went in, and I forget which senator it was, and he's looking at me because I don't even think he knew the bill was amended. And <clears throat> we sit down, and the cameras are clicking, and we're talking. And Tom Ridge is sitting there talking to me. People didn't know what he was talking about. Tom Ridge was talking to me about school vouchers, trying to convince me to support a school voucher program in Wilkinsburg, which wasn't in my district back in Allegheny County. And we're sitting there. We're talking, what have you. And he signs. I sign. The senator signs. And I got a picture in my office uh, back home with uh, the pen that I used and the bill and the three of us at the table and I always smile and it's an agriculture bill and people say, you weren't on the agriculture committee. I said, it's a long story. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, you also were involved with legislation surrounding um, rent to own yes. as well. Yeah. Uh, again, Pennsylvania did not have a law that governed rent uh, to, to own. Mm -hmm. Be it TV, VCR, or whatever the case may be. And I got very much involved in that, helped shape some legislation for Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and it became sort of like landmark legislation because there were other states that wanted to get involved. You know, these are the kind of things I like to do, mm -hmm. is the cutting edge things, things other members weren't doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you make friends, sometimes you make enemies when you do that. Uh, probably the biggest legislative effort I was involved in here was a, a package of bills that Representative Andrew Karn and I uh, worked on. He was from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. called Karn Robinson, one, Karn Robinson, two. And it dealt with the building of major sports and recreation facilities in Pennsylvania okay. and how that should be done. Some people thought, because we were African Americans, that our concern was minority involvement or getting opportunities for minority contractors. But the legislation never spoke to that. Andrew and I didn't speak to that. It was about whether or not the state should grant or loan money to entities that wanted to do business with us to build these facilities. In Andrew's case, there was a proposal to build two stadiums in Philadelphia. In my case, there was a proposal to build uh, two facilities in Pittsburgh. Mm. And Karin Robinson 1 and 2 spoke to how the Commonwealth's portion of that financing should be handled. And I never forget uh, Governor Tom Ridge uh, when the bills uh, 
the financing bills finally passed without Carr and Robinson one or two, because we were not successful in getting that in. We were successful in changing the grant to what some people called a groan, a hybrid of a grant and a loan. And he said that Carr and Robinson one and two uh, was very much instrumental in changing the way the Commonwealth was going to fund mm. major stadium projects. And while none of our legislation passed, uh, the administration did decide to change the process for making that money available. And so that was probably <clears throat> the biggest and best legislative effort because there's a lot of politics, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of horse trading, a lot of back and forth. We had some Republican support. I never forget talking to uh, Bob Casey, who was then the Auditor General, and Barbara Hafer, who was the Treasurer, about their help in this regard in terms of uh, utilizing Commonwealth money. And Andrew and I traveled all across this state talking to people. Uh, there must have been 10 or 12 bills in each of those packages, Carr and Robinson 1 and 2. And I felt very good about that. Uh, and that, that, in many respects, probably highlighted my interest in spreading mm -hmm. the wealth, spreading opportunity. And I can really relate to President-elect Obama talking about spreading the wealth. I know exactly what he's talking about, mm -hmm. creating opportunities for other people and making sure that we're leveraging public dollars to their maximum use. Wow. Another issue that, uh, that we found that you had um, addressed several times was on urban blight. Um, was this a problem? Um, in your particular district, um, was it constituent based or was it something that you just thought was necessary to, to address? Uh, in my district, I had a lot of vacant, vandalized and abandoned mm -hmm. properties. And I felt that one thing I could do was follow up on the interest I had when I was on city council. And that is take mm -hmm. vacant, abandoned, vandalized property. Mm -hmm turn it over to individuals or community groups and organizations for a dollar, a minimum fee, and help them rehab it. Yeah. Uh, and so I saw a great opportunity here at the state level to help communities all across the state. Mm. In the process of doing that and working very hard on blight reduction legislation, I ran smack dab in the eminent domain. This whole concept that government can come in, take private property for a public use. I learned more about eminent domain than I knew I could learn. Mm -hmm. One I learned that one of my predecessors, the Honorable Homer S. Brown, who was the first African American in the legislature, had worked on this issue and had put in place essentially the eminent domain law in Pennsylvania that affected what was going on in Pittsburgh around the building of the stadiums and some, some other things. And I wrote an article with the help of Mike Herzing here uh, in the House called uh, Redevelopment Redux. And it was a, 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 like a history of this redevelopment law and its impact in Pittsburgh and what I was trying mm -hmm. to do. And then um, I suggested that we change the eminent domain law in Pennsylvania, which has been changed. Uh, Kathy Mandarino, I believe, is still here in the House. She worked on this issue uh, to change the way governments take private property. My position was government should not be allowed to take your private property so that a Walmart or a Home Depot can have a parking lot. If these companies want to go into business with you, that's what they ought to do. They should not be able to use government. It wasn't necessarily a very popular idea that I was, I was promoting, but across the country there was this interest in trying to make the eminent domain laws more user-friendly for people who had private property that might be taken. There's a court case that uh, relates to Daniel Webster, a uh, great attorney, former attorney, uh, and it relates to uh, Dartmouth College hmm. in New Hampshire. And he won a case before the United States Supreme Court, I believe it was in 1803. And his position is, of what good is it going to be for the state of New Hampshire? to take over Dartmouth College. Mm. And he won the case. Uh, he said there was no good public use. And I went back to that case and, and learned some history about eminent domain and how it has historically been used and tried to find a way to update our eminent domain laws here in, 
in, in Pennsylvania. And that was a great, great learning experience. I uh, talked to a lot of smart people about it. And uh, I, I believe that what we do now in Pennsylvania around blight reduction, in some measure, relates to my efforts here in, in, in the legislature. Great. Minority issues were also important to you during your, your term. Why do you think having an Office of Minority Health Affairs was necessary? Uh, this was something that the late uh, Representative David Richardson had worked on. He was out of, out of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave always felt that if we were going to reduce the incidence of negative health in the communities across Pennsylvania, that we need to look at those communities where these incidents were very high. And unfortunately, they were very high in communities of color. And I looked at some other states who had uh, attempted this, some states that had put something in place. Mm -hmm. And I thought this would be a great thing for Pennsylvania and uh, worked diligently to make it happen. Uh, under my watch, it, it did not happen, or under Dave's watch. But I still believe this is a valid way of zeroing in on the health concerns of people of color in this Commonwealth who unfortunately have some of the worst health conditions of any population group. But these are health conditions that can be uh, addressed, problems that can be solved. But I think we have to concentrate resources. We have to concentrate people. We have to concentrate money yeah. in getting that done. And so I dedicated myself uh, to that. And some of those uh, negative indices were in my legislative district. So I had a personal interest in terms of the people that I served. Yeah. How was working with, the, um, with leadership, um, whether with the leadership or, or when you had to go against the leadership. And, and did you ever think about becoming a leader? Never thought about becoming a leader. I was concentrating on trying to become a chairman, committee chairman. Um, when I came here, Bill DeWeese and Mike Vion and uh, others were in the process of really building their career in the House in terms of, of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Mandarino was still the speaker. At that time, Bob O'Donnell uh, was, I believe, the majority leader. Uh, and Ivan Itkin, Mark Cohen, uh, Jeff Coy were some of the people. Uh, Dwight Evans were in that mm -hmm. Democratic leadership. And I worked very well with them. Um, my voting record probably would indicate that, like most members in our caucus, we voted with our leadership. And I'll never forget Leroy Irvis telling us something when he left the House. And he spoke to the Democratic caucus, and he said, on procedural matters, follow your leaders. On matters of conscience, vote accordingly. He said, that's the only advice I'll give to you new members, you new freshman members. Uh, and I found that to be good advice, and I always use that. Yeah. On procedural matters, uh, what you might call caucus matters, we're trying to drive a caucus agenda. I always supported uh, my leadership, but on matters of conscience, uh, I voted accordingly. How do you feel about the seniority system? Uh, it was working to my disadvantage when I got here. <laughs> and before I left, it had not worked to my advantage. Uh, I'm figuring if I was still in the House, I might be ready to be a chairman now. Mm -hmm. uh, I came here when Democrats were in the majority. Uh, half the time I served, half of those 14 years, Republicans were in the majority, and half that time, Democrats were in the majority. So I never moved up very much. I came in a very big class, a class of about 28, 29 Republicans and Democrats. My last name begins with an R. And there were a lot of people in front of me in my class on the Democratic side whose names um, began with letters that came before R. And then you had all the people who were here for you got here. Yeah. So the class of 89 probably might be just coming into its own, but you got to be here 18, 20 years. Uh, to get a chairmanship, and I was very appreciative of the hard work that members have put in to become chairman, and why s some members stayed as long as they did. Yeah. But uh, I almost got there, but uh, not quite. Mm -hmm. What obstacles do you think you came across um, when trying to get some of your legislation passed, whether it was in the committee or on the House floor or even in the amendment process? Uh, not being able to convince leadership on my side that my bill was a priority. Yeah. Uh, they usually had their priorities. They usually worked their priorities through the caucus, through other chairs. There's a lot of issues. You figure in any given year, four or 5,000 pieces of legislation are, are uh, sponsored. And uh, I was a sponsor or a co-sponsor of a lot of that legislation. 
but a very small portion of it ever gets onto the floor, much less passed. And so trying to get leadership, be it Republican or Democrat, to support what you want to do is difficult. Uh, you've got to really spend some time on it. I saw several members become frustrated with the slow pace in the House, and they stayed one or two terms, and they went and did, did something else. Ken Lee came into the House, I believe, when I came in 89. He stayed one or two terms, and he just said, I'm going to go back to being a lawyer. I, I can't get anything done here. I never felt I couldn't get anything done. I knew it was going to take time to get it done. I knew you had to wait for your opportunities. Mm -hmm. And also knew that the amendment process sometimes was your best way of getting something done, which was the case for me with the, the identity theft right. law. There's the identity theft law uh, growing and germinating in an agriculture bill mm -hmm. because I was able to make an arrangement across the aisle to get an amendment passed. Right. Do you think it was... Uh I don't want to say easier, but was it was it better, or even more fun? I should say um, to do more work in the committees, or to do actually be on the House floor during session days. For me, on, on the House floor, I like the excitement. Yeah. I like the debate. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I sat down in leadership row, so I was sitting down there with the leaders. So I got a little different perspective than others. I was hearing and seeing things that other members, uh, certainly on the Democratic side, were not hearing and seeing. Uh, the committee work uh, was kind of uh, tedious. It was thorough. We had great staff, uh, worked with some great staff people. They made us all look real good and uh, never had a bad piece of legislation drafted. The Legislative Reference Bureau, uh, we're very fortunate in Pennsylvania to have the people who work up there, the lawyers and the clerical staff and leadership up there. And so I found the House floor to be more exciting even when I didn't have an amendment. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot more in the committees about legislation and what members would support and how you draft legislation. Was there a typical session day when you were on the floor, or were they all different? Uh, I think most of them were different, except the days when we had the big issues, okay. like abortion, uh, tax increase, pay raise. Um, things of that type, tight budget years. But other than that, it was kind of routine. I mean, you had a long list of legislation, and a lot of it was held over. I know in my present capacity on county council, I oftentimes suggest to our president, if there's a bill he's not ready to move, pass over. And he just looks at me like, what is that? Mm. And then he says, I don't think I can do that. I said, sure you can do it. You're, you're the presiding officer. You have the gavel. If you don't want to bring a bill up for consideration, it doesn't come up. Mm. Uh, and so I saw a lot of that, bills that got onto the agenda. But for whatever reason, they didn't get worked on the floor. And I think a lot of that had to do with leadership's agenda. And if I had to come back again, I would work leadership on my side a lot better. And whatever contacts I had on the Republican side for those burning hot uh, issues. Yeah. Not necessarily you were specifically involved with um, with regards to sponsorship, but what do you think was uh, the most difficult issue before the legislature while you were there? The abortion issue. Was it? And it was amazing how it was processed. Mm -hmm. The men on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, let the women on both sides take the leadership on the issue. Mm. And the House was basically split between uh, Republican women and Democrat women. And they basically took the lead on either side of the issue. Mm. I found that members literally did not change the position they originally had. And we went on and on and on and on and on. i never forget Steve Friend <clears throat> standing up on the Republican side and giving a nice speech. He's one of the few men that, that ventured in, out into that area. And the rest of us were sitting there, and I remember Frank Gigolotti saying, why don't we just vote? Nobody's position is going to change. Let's vote. This is real contentious. And I looked at him, I said, there's only one issue that's more contentious than this. He said, what? I said, integration. Uh, and finally, when we voted, there were about 30 that voted uh, against the Abortion Control Act that Governor Casey was pushing. 
Um, and that was the same 30 yeah. that start that start out. Others went ahead and 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 supported it, and uh, that probably was the most contentious uh, issue, even more contentious than than some of the budget votes. And I guess it's because members knew how personal it was, how inflammatory it was. But I thought it was interesting that the men sort of decided to let the women yeah. handle it. Yeah. Did you see many changes in the House during your time there? Yeah. I, one of the things that Bob O'Donnell did, I thought, was really professionalize our staff. He took them to a new level, a uh, new level of accountability. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Al Cawley, who's, who's deceased now, uh, who had responsibility for a lot of the administrative work in the House. Al was a great guy, and uh, he would help you work through what Bob O'Donnell, as speaker in particular, mm -hmm. wanted to do. And I think that's Bob's lasting legacy, is he took us to a new level in terms of computerization, in terms of personnel, uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of support systems that members needed that made sense, yeah. uh, that we could afford, uh, I think, in terms of how we managed our finances uh, in all the caucuses. And to some extent, uh, when Bob raised the questions of pension benefits and a pay raise, some members felt he was being disloyal to the Democratic caucus, and uh, he didn't, he wasn't re-elected speaker. Yeah. Uh, that's when Bill DeLeese was uh, elected speaker on the Democratic side, and I'm sure that hurt Bob a lot, but uh, he did a great service to the people of this Commonwealth by professionalizing the House of Representatives. One of the changes that we see today is uh, uh, the technology advancement. Um, there are laptops on every table. There's the uh, the continual video feed of of the of the sessions. Do you have an opinion on 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 if that's a good thing? I think it's great. Every legislative body I've served in Pittsburgh City Council, Allegheny County Council, Pennsylvania House of Representatives has gone through a technology change while I was there, and that main change has been more information and getting on TV, yeah. uh, letting our constituents see us. And there's always this apprehension that if people see us, somehow they won't appreciate us. And I always felt that we needed uh, to let people see us. We needed to do the people's business in public. If you're sitting there reading the newspaper, as I often did, have a good reason. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason to pretend that all the time we're spending here is serious. Sometimes it's not serious, and sometimes we make yeah. mistakes. And the fact that you make them on television probably is no big deal. Yeah. And I found that most members, wherever I've been, they get comfortable. They get back to taking care of business. They don't say anything they normally wouldn't say or do anything they normally wouldn't do mm -hmm. on s most occasions. <laughs> uh, but the laptops, when I was here, laptops were just coming in. Yeah. And right before I left, uh, you know, you have this laptop here, and you're working through it. When I was on city council and now I'm on county council, we don't have and did not have that readily available. You can get a laptop on Allegheny County Council, uh, but it's not plugged in officially to your work there at your desk. Members don't bring their laptop, okay. if they have, and all members don't have them, uh, to, to, to the desk there and work. We have computers in our offices. Uh, but some members uh, either don't want a laptop or don't feel it's necessary. But I think here in the House, that was that was just a great uh, a great uh, move. And uh, again, a tribute to the leadership on both the Republican and Democratic side uh, that they wanted the legislators to be able to serve the constituents better. Yeah. How was your relationship with with the media, specifically in your own district? Uh, I thought it was good. Yeah. Um, I felt there was one paper that uh, didn't treat me very well, but I didn't expect them to, okay? I had been at odds with them on a couple issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, I gave every media outlet the same opportunity uh, to interview me or get information f for me. Uh, the New Pittsburgh Courier was particularly uh, open to me writing a weekly column called Bill's Book. Yeah. And Mike Herzing uh, on the staff here in the House worked with me every week on that. Uh, I did a radio program. Bob Klein and others uh, here worked with me on that, did a uh, television program twice a month mm. right here in this studio. And so I got out to the media, I got out to the public, uh, I was always sending out press releases, I never forget uh, in a campaign 
one of my opponents accused me of only sending out press releases. <laughs> I told somebody, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm building my archives <laughs> there you in go. advance. But uh, I thought I had a very positive relationship with the media. I had uh, infrequent press conferences. I didn't want to waste the media's time sure. pumping my ego. But I, I sent out a lot of um, press releases, but I used the media center uh, to have press conferences occasionally. Uh, Carr and Robinson 1 and 2, we used it extensively. Uh, and occasionally I came up with some of my colleagues on some other uh, bills. Great. What would you say was your favorite aspect of the job here in the House? My favorite aspect of the job? I think that, that my favorite uh, part was being on the floor and being able to vote. Mm -hmm. And being able to vote uh, my conscience of knowing that my constituents had confidence in my judgment mm -hmm. and that I could vote whatever way I wanted to. That I wasn't really constrained by leadership. I wasn't part of any clique or anything. And that I could be very thoughtful and deliberative and really look beyond the 19th legislative district and look to all the people in Pennsylvania. So uh, I relished those opportunities to be on the floor and to reach out and push either that red or green button and then look up and see my name uh, lit and to know uh, that I was doing something uh, beyond myself for people who I would never know and never see. Did you have a least favorite aspect? Probably in the latter years, the travel back and forth, it began to take its toll. Uh, getting up early if I was flying, uh, driving home into the sun, sometimes driving west, uh, the grind of maybe having to come back for committee meetings and other things. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where the, the, the perks and the compensation, all that, yeah. uh, wasn't bouncing off on the wear and tear physically and, and mentally. And so down at the end, I could honestly say that the travel back and forth was my least favorite. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask each of the members when I talk with them if they have a specific or, or interesting story that they'd like to share, whether it be funny, happy, sad, something that, that not many people would probably know about what happens. Well, I have two. Okay. One relates to my last speech in the uh, House of Representatives, the speech that's in the record book, a speech that'll be here for all ages, my farewell address. And I'll never forget getting up in front of the House. It was in uh, late November. In fact, it was the day I was physically leaving the House. And I got up, and I looked out at all my colleagues, and Ron Marsica and I both had attended the Ohio State University, but at different mm -hmm. times. We were probably the only two Ohio State Buckeye fans in uh, this part <laughs> of Pennsylvania. And I got up, and this was a year that Ohio State had done very well, was on its way to winning a national championship. Mm -hmm. And I got up, and I looked out at the crowd. Before I said anything else, I said, how about them Buckeyes? <laughs> <laughs> then I went on with my speech. But at the end of that day, there's something that occurred that most people don't know. And uh, I'll tell you about it. When I left my office, said goodbye to my secretary, and we had packed up everything, and things had been sent back to Pittsburgh. Uh, and I was going down to take my last ride my last official mm -hmm. ride uh, in a state vehicle out to the airport to catch a plane back to Pittsburgh. And going down the steps from the third floor in the uh, what is now the Kayla Irvis office building with South Office building, I cried going all the way down the steps because oh. I just hated to leave. Mm -hmm. And it hurt so bad. Uh, not necessarily because of uh, uh, the way I was leaving, but uh, that I had to leave. Yeah. I just loved being here. And by the time I got outside, my eyes were dry, and I was gone. The other th story that I thought was real good was a story of, of uh, friendship and trust and honesty. Uh, and then I got one more. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt Ryan and I developed a relationship. Matt and I had a very interesting conversation once on the House floor that wasn't too pleasant. And uh, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is going to signal a bad relationship. Yeah. But subsequent to that, we came to a situation where I asked Matt Ryan to appoint me to the Board of Trustees of the University of Pittsburgh. And I also asked him what 
he give me another appointment too. Mm. He said, yes. And I worked with him on some things that he wanted. Well, I got appointed, and it was time for the second appointment. And I saw Matt one day in a men's lounge, and I uh, was standing with Roger Nick, his trusted assistant, and I mentioned it to him. And he says, I don't remember that. And I told him exactly where we met, told him uh, what he said he was going to do, that he would allow me to recommend someone to him to be appointed in addition to myself. He said, I'm going to trust you. If you say I said that, take your word for it. I said, Roger, I'll take care of this within a half hour. Within a half hour, Roger Nick called me and said it's done. Wow. And it was done. Uh, and I really appreciate that because I think sometimes people don't believe the politicians can be trusted. Mm. And even though we were statesmen here, at home we were politicians, and our word was our bond. And I appreciated that, uh, that he was able to do that. We could shake hands and that, uh, across the aisle mm -hmm. and do something that we both had agreed. The other story is, is uh, kind of funny. Uh, when I first came here, Bill DeWeese and Mike Vion took me under their wing. And one night we're sitting around and we were discussing the helmet law. As you know, Mike Vion was a great uh, advocate of uh, bikers, what have you. And I didn't know at the time he, he, he wrote. And he and Bill liked to smoke cigars. And so we met in DeWeese's office one night. We were talking about the helmet law. They were trying to convince me that this was a good mm -hmm. bill for me to vote against because they didn't want helmets. And they explained to me all about it in the groups that were supporting. They were making a lot, of, a lot of good sense about letting people ride without helmets if they were adults and et cetera, et cetera. And we're sitting there, and they opened this box, and they each took a cigar, and they handed one to me. It's about 9 o'clock at night. It's, it's, it's quiet. It's dark. And the lights are outside the Capitol, and we all light up. And I looked at them, and I said, you know, I've heard about smoke-filled rooms, and now I'm in one. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Um, speaking of, of, you know, the different uh, members that you got along with, how was the camaraderie? among the members, both on and off the floor? Uh, I found that it was very good, very positive. Yeah. Uh, that when we had our differences on the floor, they pretty much stayed there. Mm -hmm. And you always had people that you would hang out with or be more friendly with than others. That's just human nature. Sure. But I found members to be cordial and to be friendly and to be human. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a story. There were times when members were hurting. There were times that were very joyous. And it wasn't always a fun time for members because they had family obligations. Uh, I was here when Jim Mandarino passed. Mm. Uh, I was here when Dave Richardson passed. But I was also here when new members came to the house with their eyes wide open. I was here uh, when... There were members who wanted uh, to change things and make things uh, better. And uh, that, that was a great experience to see this mix of emotion. This is mm -hmm. a mix of, uh, of uh, personalities. Uh, that we, I remember when Angel Cruz came uh, and brought his own Latin flavor <laughs> to, to the House. Uh, Republicans and Democrats. It was just a, a great experience to see members, male and female, come and go. I remember Pat Vance oftentimes b being allowed to uh, be the speaker by Matt Ryan. He gave her an opportunity to do that. Uh, I began to appreciate the significance of a woman presiding over the House, if just for a short period of time. Now, obviously, you're still involved in politics, yes. serving in, in Allegheny County. Do you still follow state politics? Oh, yes. The last time I was sworn in, I was sworn in on a Bible that I received as a member, and I was sworn in here too. And I remember saying that this Bible represented my connection to the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. that I was still a part of the House of Representatives in Harrisburg, and I was connecting it to being a part of a new and budding institution, County Council, mm -hmm. which is eight, nine years old, and there's an institution in Harrisburg that's almost 400 years old mm -hmm. that I was a part of, and I just felt so, so good about it. I could, this Bible was the, was the connection. And I, I follow all the politics. I follow uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I follow the members. Sometimes I see former members uh, back in Pittsburgh, 
And uh, it's a, a unique uh, fraternal organization uh, for those of us who have been in the House. Very few people in this Commonwealth have had an opportunity to serve here. Yeah. And it's very sobering when you get your two minutes. And you get your two minutes when you're deceased. And the Speaker informs the House of your demise. They read an appropriate resolution. And then there's like that moment of silence. And then we go back to business. Mm -hmm. And occasionally a member will say, who was that person? Do you remember them? And sometimes there's no one there that served with them. And sometimes there are those of us who have served with someone who, who passes in office. But it's uh, a solemn occasion, but it's, it's the highest tribute that we can pay to former members is to uh, give them that moment of, uh, of silence. Mm -hmm. How would you like your tenure in the House to be remembered? Uh, I'd like to be remembered as a guy who really wanted to do the right thing, mm -hmm. who was willing to work with anybody, willing to work with everybody, who was full of life. A legislator who actually wanted to make a mark, who wanted to make a stamp, who wanted to leave a legacy, mm -hmm. uh, who wanted to do some big, great things, not just for himself, but for the people of Pennsylvania, uh, that he wanted to do well by his district, uh, that he wanted his constituents to say he worked hard, he had our interests at heart. And while we may have disagreed with him on a number of things, we respected him. Uh, and we know his service in Harrisburg was honorable, mm -hmm. that he was a man of honorable, and that title, honorable, is one that he earned. Any regrets or issues that you didn't get a chance to, to cover while you were here? Uh, wish I could stay a little longer. Uh, I figured maybe one or two more terms, uh, then I probably would have been ready to go. If I could have made 20 years, mm -hmm. which would have been three more terms, maybe I'd have been a chairman. Uh, but I just wanted to stay a little longer, probably would have liked to have left office winning an election. I left office after losing an election. Uh, that hurt. Uh, but other than that, um, no regrets. I had a great time here. I served well. I served honorably. I'm just glad I was a part of this. And uh, I'm just glad that I met so many nice people here, staff, as well as members, lobbyists, I had a great experience with them. They were very helpful. Final question for you. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in becoming a, um, a politician, or specifically even someone who wants to be a, a representative? Uh, I would say that what they really need to do is ask themselves, are they willing to commit 24-7 mm. to being a politician? to being an elected official? Are you willing to go to all the community and neighborhood meetings? Are you willing to keep a smile on your face? Are you willing to absorb not so kind comments? Can you refrain from retaliating against people, getting angry with people, being selfish? Uh, can you stand the grind? Because it's 24 seven. How long can you stand it? Because it's gonna take its, its toll. Yeah. And is this something that you truly love? I think the most successful politicians and elected officials love what they do. And when you stop loving it, it's time to leave it uh, if you have that opportunity. So I would advise them to, to do that first and then to prepare themselves, not so much in knowing all the issues, but prepare themselves around their own values, their own morals, what you will and will not do, areas where you need to grow, uh, my motto is cooperation with others, competition with self. Mm. And when the going gets tough, it's no quit and no excuses. Nice. Representative William Robinson, I want to thank you very much thank for you. participating in our oral history and for sharing your stories. And good luck in everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Good job.